Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Ryan. Robert? Hi, everyone. I don't know what happened to Robert. Let me just check to make sure he's still okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Ingebretson. I thank you for joining me this afternoon on what's a very dense topic. Uh, it's been 400 years in the making, and uh, we will talk a little bit about, well, with actually, this is the second of two webinars. Um, the overall title is The Natives Are Restless, Colonialism, White Supremacy, and the Capital Coup. The language I'm using here, the natives restless, or of course, a kind of a, a, a riff on the language of colonialism, which establishes the kind of power dynamic around individual groups and ethnicities that that we'll be talking about. The flag, as you see, is the distress signal of a flag upside down. Last week we talked, let me just kind of review where we were. I went slave patrols to ghost skins, law enforcement, colonialism, and race dominance. Because the topic that we have here tonight and today is not new, and it's been part of our country and part of actually, say, Western global Europe, uh, Western Europe for, for at least 400 years. Uh, so last week, for those who recall, and this is all recorded with Robert, uh, we talked a little bit about fake news, and my point was that when you start talking about what is white supremacy, it's it's nothing personal. It's a theory of history in one sense. That is to say, when we personalize it, as you'll see that I do here today with the images of people, uh, <clears throat> that's kind of a, a, a teaching kind of a strategy to have a visual. But the point is that it's not the individual shiny objects, which is what the New York Times calls them, that we should be paying attention to. So when you see when you see an advertisement that says bad mothers and bad fathers and parents who killed their children, yeah, okay, uh, so that's the shiny object and let's pay attention instead to the systems in which such um, terrible things happen. So the same thing about uh, racism and white supremacy, and it's easy, and we saw that this week in the, the hearings in Congress, it's easy to shout and yell and this person's racist and that person's racist. That is, as the New York Times would call it, a shiny object. Pay no attention to that, look behind the curtain to the person pulling the pulling the the strings. The second section was a, a, a more elaborated thing on colonialism and the modern nation state. Uh, and the point that I would make here is that when we start talking global, the language that we're using is, I'm sorry to say it, colonial in the sense that it is European. Um, that is what's intended. Uh, and so and possibly one should, instead of saying global, one should be say it as it is and call it the white modern nation global state because that's that's essentially what's what is happening and when you start talking about the difference between what's going on in ukraine now and what happened in the mid 90s and early 2000s in a different part of the, of the country a different part of the world one can see how sorry race and ethnicity do play out still and the third section was more specifically to uh, what I called global white under colonial eyes. So that is to say, the eye of the camera is always colonial. It's always a power dynamic between two groups of persons. And the person holding the camera is the person who has the control. OK, so to pick up from where we were last week when I said that the the system of white supremacy is not it's nothing personal. It's, it's a system, and it, it starts in a variety of different kinds of ways. Just this, you know, um, of the 115 Supreme Court justices in the U.S. history, all but seven have been white men. According to 2021 American Bar Association, African Americans in 2021 made up only 5% of the nation's lawyers no doubt black women make up a share even smaller than that. To the point of the hearings, and I will make a point here in terms of usage, uh, this is a quote from Times, after they use the expression African Americans. I typically will not use African American unless I use the expression European American, because the reference constantly to African Americans with an unmarked center being the European American simply continues to make a certain group of people do the same kind of work. 
So what I will try and do today in a, probably about an hour and a half, uh, there's a lots of dense material, and again, I invite folks to see the recording later and to get in contact with me through, through Robert if you need to. The history of colonial white nationalism in the alt-right, this is now all United States. The political convergence of the ideology and political violence of nationalism because they're two different things. Um, second session, oh, white supremacy and law, the abiding and historic link between police and race, policing and racing in the United States. And then three, it can't happen here, the January 6th and its links to the military and law enforcement. Again, this is a lot of unhappiness in this particular webinar, and I'm sorry that it's the first one I'm doing in the spring, and I wish it could be a, a, um, a better topic. And what I will be doing essentially is, is, is pulling together lots of material that is already out in the public. And so you'll hear the refrain, it can't happen here, it can't happen here, and we wonder, mm, well, um, going back to a slide that I had last week, Washington didn't say this, Washington George, with his 123 um, enslaved persons who, who parked at the Federal District of Columbia just a few miles from his, from his own plantation. Um, he did that for reasons. Um, Thomas Jefferson didn't say this. Uh, he of the 600 uh, enslaved persons uh, whom he used to mortgage um, Monticello. He never said white privilege, but uh, when he was president in Washington, in Washington, his third presidency in Washington, D.C., uh, he would walk down to the center market uh, a few blocks from the White House and investigate the enslaved being sold and check the fruits and vegetables, and there's, there's documentation of that. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt didn't exactly say this either. He of the, the only good Indian I know is the dead Indian. So they didn't say these kinds of things, and these are the three persons they said, the, two or four, Lincoln is the other, on the um, uh, Mount Rushmore. Uh, it's what their words intended. They wouldn't call it privilege, and they wouldn't even call it white. But white nationalism has very deep and specifically American roots. And um, this can kind of get on people's nerves when they keep hearing this, but uh, it's true. And another thing that I'll be doing for Robert probably in a month, we're looking at the links between the Nazi regime and really what they borrowed, and actually they quoted it in court, what they borrowed from our Supreme Court documents, among other things. About, the, uh, about race, about law, and about eugen eugenics. So in a long overdue, this is the Washington Times, Washington Post, long overdue excavation of the book in 1916 that Hitler called his Bible and the man who wrote it. If you know, um, so this is the passing of the great race, the racial basis of European history. This is where we start, and this is, uh, it's gonna be the background of everything that we've done if you know your great Gatsby, for example, Tom Buchanan, uh, kind of a, a Daisy's bully, he keeps referring to um, you know the, the black box, and he keeps referring to uh, this book, for example. And this is Gatsby in 1921, I think is the thing. Um, and so this particular man, uh, Madison Grant, a zoologist actually, as secretary of the New York Zoological Society, he lobbies to put Uta Benga, a Congolese man from the Madubi people on display alongside the apes at the Bronx Zoo. So in the US, the calculus of racial purity, a fetish through the 19th century starts with populism and no nothings, and that meant no blacks needed to apply, no Irish needed to apply, uh, no Italians needed to apply, no Jews needed to apply, uh, and specifically no Asians needed to apply. And so uh, when you rush it all together like that, uh, you say, who's left? Well, the Europeans, essentially. and so. While, while it was all kind of ad hoc, ad hoc, it began to kind of cluster together around a specific group. But the 20th century immigration and race panic, using Jefferson's breeding protocol, and I recall I'm referring back now to his words from, um, in Notes on Virginia, where he says, well, you know, the thinking person is going to see how we arrange plants and how we breed plants and how we put one next to the other. Surely they should see this in terms of the human species as well. Uh, you can hear the, his words and you can hear what he is saying and you can see how colonialism and the power dynamic uh, of um, the European history and its colonies, including us, gives a certain race a, a kind of way of, well, now we can pick and choose these and put these because they clearly are not up to our standards. 
But so the actual title of this uh, early 20s, 1920s book, The Rising Tide of Color, the actual title is The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. So just that we understand that this language of white and world supremacy, this is not new language. It is really not. Okay? And nor is the U.S. alone with purest populism. And again, I'm doing something again for Robert on that. Um, the free flow of money from the U.S. to Nazi Germany, the free flow of ideas, the free flow of medical, the, the free flow of legal aid, the free, the, the, so that the, the, the Nazi regime essentially took their Nuremberg laws from models that we had already in place. So the converging influences that govern the United States policy of race-based legal apartheid, not segregation, it's apartheid, it's law. It's the same ideology that made possible a different form of manifest destiny, the final solution. <clears throat> and the expression of the final solution itself is the United States expression, it's a Congress expression for what to do with the, the final solution to the, to the indigenous, or what they called the, the Indian problem when they're trying to put the, the trains through the Transcontinental Railroad. So indeed, the U.S. provides a template for the Nazi regime. We're not looking at that here, but we will, again, back and forth a bit talk about, about Hitler's uh, American uh, learning. Uh, Stoddard's phrase, undermit, undermit, the rising tide of color, is actually translated into the German, the untermensch. So here's the book again, here's its translation, and after languishing in prison, a very disaffected Bavarian corporal who was there for a civic uprising sends a letter to Madison Grant. This book is my Bible, he writes, and the soldier later includes whole sections of Grant's book in his own, Mein Kampf, and published in 1924. So, so white nationalism is a type of ethnicity which espouses the belief of a nationhood that white people are a race, and th this is very curious kind of language because it, well, uh, the, the word that, that e even from the time that, that uh, people like Jefferson would use race, they would use it in a way that had no real connection with biology and was more a cultural expression. So now in a pseudo-scientific and later science age when we speak thinking of race, uh, the earlier usage has a very different meaning. It seeks to develop and maintain racialized national identity. And we'll see a map later on in the country, with, uh, later on in my presentation, about what that is. And many of its proponents identify with attached to the concept of a white nation or a white ethnostate. Last week, we briefly attempted to look at the ongoing effects of race dominance. Attempts to eliminate black and Indian and Mexican and Asian the drive for the pure state. And in November uh, 10th, 2016, this was a, a graffiti that greeted Trump's win across the US. And by the way, I'm not blaming a specific president or a specific group of people, um, but you be, we begin to see how things do converge here. So the, the seeds of Nazism is an ultimate nationalist objective, the preservation of a pure white race, uncontaminated by foreign blood. You pause. You think, this sounds like exactly the reporting out of Christchurch, Australia. It, it is. It was, in fact, sown with, with success by law and coercion in the United States. Why do I say coercion? Um, I say coercion because, as a matter of fact, Jim Crow legal apartheid law is coercive. It's legal. So what is judged extremist, perhaps today, at least by a certain kind of liberal set, oh, it's like these things that we're hearing in public, was once the consensus of a powerful cadre of the American elite. And um, I'm sure that your grandparents and great-grandparents, uh, they probably had certificates to enable them to get married, and they had uh, the, the, the eugenics motion. Um, and, you know, the, the language that we have, idiot and moron, for example, is, it was out of a out of a U.S. military um, intelligence exam. And basically, it was, it was trying to decide who was intelligent and more intelligent, and these were, their, these were their categories that they used. So the expression of race suicide, this is Madison Grant in 1920, 1916. This is part of the immigration scare of the early 19th, 20th century. This is where you get the 19th, 20th, 24th uh, Virginia uh, Racial Purity Act. This is where you get the, United, the Congress's 24 Immigration Act, um, Anti-Asian Immigration Act. So these are wealthy patricians, intellectuals, lawmakers, and even several presidents. Uh, Woodrow Wilson being a primary candidate for this. 
but most importantly was Madison Grant. We've already talked a bit about him. I had this here paused in yellow because I, I want to go back to my point here earlier on race. On the left, Roger Tawney writing for the majority in the Dred Scott decision in which he says that, that no Negro in this country is a citizen or can be. That's what the text says and you can look that up. But he writes, it's difficult at this day to realize the state of public opinion in relation to that unfortunate race, pause, there's that language again, which prevailed in the civilized and enlightened portions of the world at the time of the Declaration of Independence and when the Constitution of the United States was framed and adopted, 1760, 1770. The public history of every European nation displays it in a manner too plain to be mistaken. So his apology here is, it's the public history of every European nation. They had for more than a century before 1650 been regarded as beings of an inferiority. Pause, okay, this is the beginnings of enslaved colonialism that we particularly know it, late 1550s to the 1600s, when as a matter of fact, because of labor needs, uh, the European nations, starting with Portugal and then Spain, and then Britain who became kind of the Uber, driving people on their particular boats around from these places. They're, that's when they began um, uh, kidnapping nation, uh, extra nationals from, uh, from Africa and other places. Altogether unfit to associate with a white race either in social or political relations. You see the fudge here, he goes from European to white. Okay, This is now becoming more and more common, but the expression white, uh, I've used this example before when you hear Sting thank him, uh, saying, you know, I'm an Englishman in, uh, in New York. Uh, persons would not have used white. They would have used, I'm an Englishman, I'm Christian, typically. Uh, they are so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Your 2000 census states, racial categories, quote, generally reflect a social definition of race recognized in this country. They do not conform to any biological, anthropological, or gen genetic criteria. So how does this quick step through history meet the alt-right? The alt-right has various ideological forebears, and now we're coming again out of a, out of a specific kind of uh, chest-thumping colonial nationalism to to white supremacy, and, and that started with the neo-Nazi Ku Klux Klan groups. Um, it's different than what was happening in post-Civil War. It's different than what was happening with the early slave patrols and policing. It's different when the, from the early national uh, 1790 nationalization bill. But, but through the 1990s, several white supremacists reformulated ideas as white nationalism where they're presenting themselves not as seeking to dominate non-white racial groups, but rather as lobbying for the interests of European Americans. And although white nationalists often distance themselves from quote, white supremacism, white supremacist sentiment remains prevalent in the nationalists. The Vietnam War narrative unites folks who had previously not been able to be in the same room. Klansmen and neo-Nazis after World War II had a very difficult time aligning because the Klan saw the Nazis as enemies, people that they had been confronting in World War II. But after the mid-1960s, white supremacy remains an important ideology to the American far right. And the Vietnam conflict, the failure of what they say, the Vietnam conflict, the common cause around a sort of betrayal by the government and around, um, sorry, uh, the failed militarism, uh, and the gendered failed militarism of the Vietnam War. A coda through all of this, and an aside, um, all of these uh, the, 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 the notions around genocide and uh, dominance um, is completely gendered, and we will see that as we start talking about um, since the 60s and 70s, uh, the, the Roe versus Wade, that a, a abortion and laws around that have a, a lot of uh, filter through into what we're talking about here. So after the mid-1990s, white supremacy remains an important ideology, and it, it shifts after the Vietnam War from supporting the existing racial order to a more radical position self-described as white power or white nationalism. Are they borrowing from a, a, another version of a kind of power? Uh, possibly, but it's again, it's a trickle-down. 
They're committed to overthrowing the U.S. government and establishing a white homeland. Religious fundamentalism, sorry to say it this way, Christian particularly undergirds this. So Confederate flags and Nazi swastikas, this is 70s history, and we'll talk about that in a sentence. So that when you see that persons who were at one sense, World War II, who were enemies, are now in Colin Kyle's, Calvin League, and you can see the kind of the police in the back. This, by the way, is a, uh, is a UK image. By the Guardian, excuse me. So the 1970s sees a Nazification of the of the Klan. David Duke and others fused Klan iconography with Nazi r racialism. We'll see David Duke again. It draws national attention when members of both groups joined up in '79 to attack a Communist Worker Party in Greensboro. And so this is the massacre, as they say, that spawned now the alt right. And this is kind of, this is the pre-internet alt-right, which is a very different kind of thing. But 40 years ago, a gang of Klangsmen and Nazis murdered his five communists in broad daylight. So the seeds for our current white supremacy are 40 years ago in Greensboro. And here you can see in the, in the, in the images, the person's um, man and wife, the persons here who were in the middle of the, and here you have the Klan taking weapons out of their particular cars. So it, and you see over here the, the Greensboro Massacre. It is interesting, and, and the longer conversation is needed around what we memorialize, what we, what we memorialize in this country in terms of these sorts of uh, historical markers and what remains unmarked. But so today's white nationalism is closer to the center of American politics. And the fears about, quote, replacement of the white race, again, the language of genocide and the, the, the push in politics around abortion, well, they suddenly, well, they are not often connected in the same sentence that I'm just connecting them, but the, that and say the masculinists and the Proud Boys, the, the gendering of white supremacy and um, the links be in, between very different sets of politics needs to be understood. And as we'll see a little later, right-wing violence is, is on the rise. Far-right terrorists account for the overwhelming majority of extremist murders in the U.S. last year, more so than any that have happened in the foreign country uh, in terms of uh, terrorist reports. The Greenboro Massacre, as it became known, was the coming out, if you want, bloodbath for the white nationalist movement that's in our politics today. Here again, you see through this through the 80s, early particularly through the 90s, uh, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. David Lane, uh, founder of the order, uh, who wrote this in prison, uh, the 14 words: we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. So built into this is the uh, Kinder Kinder und Kirch. This is. A, that where women belong, is that women belong supporting these kinds of kinds of maneuvers, uh, and specifically they 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 belong contributing their bodies to the existence of children, so that the uh, uh, the the far, I keep I hate calling it just far right, but the the use of that kind of a politic, while it seems you know from the American First Caucus, well which seems perhaps not to be paying attention necessarily to. A abortion rights or rules specifically in and of themselves, but it is very much aligned with what we're seeing here in terms of white supremacist uh, and the securing of an existence of our people, a manifest destiny, to use that language, and a place and a future for white children. Again, just to pause, all of this comes back out of the settler colonialism of the Declaration of Independence. It comes out of the settler colonialism that King George III in 1673 essentially had to pass the Royal Proclamation basically to tell the, 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 the English colonials, um, this is indigenous people's land here, this is colonial land here, and never the twain shall meet. But the constant, and even uh, Jefferson in the Declaration talks about this, the constant ravaging of the, of the frontier, and he was trying to rabble whiles, uh, the frontier people to uh, help basically remove the indigenous people so that they would have the, the country. So settler colonialism is not simply we're going to come in here and, 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 and harvest your, your, your linen and your, your cotton and your sugar. We're going to come in here and eliminate you. 
Uh, so these people, Barack Obama's assassination, the Wisconsin Temple shooting, Charleston Church shooting, Pittsburgh Synagogue, Christ Church Mosque shootings, and others. Uh, white Pride, uh, 1488, the 14 words here, 88, is a code sign for Adolf Hitler. Um, this is the man who, well, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, so the alt-right as we know, so there's kind of this popular ethno-racism from birth of a nation over here, which features, of course, at the, at the same time that he was president, uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I mean, Woodrow Wilson becomes kind of a subject himself is in part of this, and it becomes like a product place. It's like Apple TV, or it's like Apple computers in now in movies. Um, so that all through the, the birth of a nation, you have Woodrow Wilson, the sitting president, being quoted, and you'll see one of those. The Turner, Di the Turner Diaries, the Turner Diaries, an apocalyptic post-Christian kind of takeover of a, of, a, of a failing government or a faulty government or illegal government, um, is the governance, uh, is the model that many of these groups go back to. Um, the Matrix, what is that doing here? Well, if you look at the Matrix and there's this notion that there's the same kind of uh, subversion the same kind of um, masking that's going forth and the, the red pills and the green pills, you'll see how they use the kind of the imagery of Matrix uh, basically to talk in code. The Turner Diaries inspires generations of white supremacists, Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh. In the, one of the things I would say in cl class about Timothy McVeigh, we didn't see this one coming in 1994, 95. You know, he's blonde, he's blue-eyed, he's a soldier. We had no way of thinking about that. We needed the people on the on the planes who were Sikhs, who were, you know, wearing robes from a different country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, he was one of our own, our own, one of our firstborns, as you want, uh, white. Uh, he had excerpts of his of the book in his getaway car. And the Turner Diaries uh, affected the order, terrorist group that robs banks, bombs theaters, synagogues. Okay. And in popular use, he's the alternate as we understand, is generally taken to refer to racist on the internet. Yeah, it's very imprecise, and there's a lot of this, as I said, it's, we cannot do justice in this in, in three, or four, uh, three or four slides. But the alt-right is a specific subset of online racists, one that believe white nationalism can triumph by trolling journalists and staging real-life demonstrations like Charlottesville. Interesting statistics, 2019, 940 hate groups, uh, uh, by the ACLU, 55% increase in national, white nationalist hate groups since 2017. 43% increase in anti-LGBTQ hate groups in 2019. So there is, uh, anecdotally and statistically, one can see on the rise. Uh, Heidi Berick, co-founder and executive vice president of the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, she reports before Congress, and it's a long, lengthy report the subject of this hearing is critical. All evidence by government agencies in the U.S. points to far-right extremism as a metastasizing problem. They're using a medical term, as, it, as you'll see it again, this epidemic. This is a cancer. So the, the, the CSIS, Center for Strategic and International Studies, concludes that far-right terrorism has significantly outpaced terrorism from other type of perpetrators including far-right networks and individuals inspired by Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. Right-wing extremists, and here we have um, the Timothy McVeigh, right-wing extremists perpetuated two-thirds of the attacks in 2019 and over 90% between January 1st and May 8th of 2020. Okay. So just an aside here, the, the groups that we're tracking here are, are not the Reddit and the 4chan and the 8chan, or even those, the QAnon, the so-called alt-right that we know. Um, these are the, what we're talking about is the basically the older version, the older strains of organized white nationalism, neo-Nazism, Ku Klux Klan, Christian identity, which we really hear about. Uh, you may have heard more about it during the... Uh, and because Christian identity with, with the cross was actually at the, the, the capital coup. It's a Christianized version of white supremacy and it. So-called race realism, whose adherents believe that there are scientific justifications and Bible justifications for racism. We have the expression poly, uh, poly, polygenism, 
in which talks about that Genesis is was well sorry to say it was the first Genesis the Bible Genesis was well the white people although it wasn't but that all these other post-colonial people that say Queen Elizabeth and her sailors John Hawkins and others and the Portuguese and the Spains all that they find in the Caribbean and other places and that uh, that Italian Columbus uh, um, I guess uh, what you call uh, racing for Spain uh, these folks were at quote uh, Jefferson probably human uh, different certainly but probably human but clearly lower so the polygenesis was there were other genesis uh, events for them so what we're seeing here these are not bored teenagers who, who are newcomers these are committed ideologues who've thought out articulated the process and on this point here in red we're just talking about jefferson and polygenesis so founders speak whether you're talking about madison himself with 123 uh, enslaved persons madison of the the three-fifths compromised in the electoral college or, or jefferson or or washington what i call founders speak you know even to even to benjamin franklin we're, we're, we're talking about well there is the reason why that we were even though britain is not a not a country that recognized enslavement um, that after time the, the British colonials before they as it became US found a way to think about oh well there's a reason why we should be doing this uh, with these people because as a matter of fact they are less than we are um, again what we were just talking about uh, the the long history of anti-abortion movements links to white supremacists it, it, this seems to be a surprise but when one thinks about it when one sees at Charlottesville the signs against the, the great replacement and you know the failure of the, of people to to, uh, to reproduce and the white people are are, 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 are diminishing uh, it suddenly makes sense and so suddenly you begin to see the energy around um, the distinction between I'm calling the homosocial, which is kind of the good old boys network, and the homosexual. That the men can clump on the streets and, and do violent things, as we will see, but they can't do this other kind of thing. Okay, so that the homosocial as a protocol of power is one thing, um, but that reproduction must be saved, specifically in heteronormativity, for keeping um, white people, securing a future. So the gender is one aspect of colonialism that's imported into the colonized countries. It includes race, but we're not exceptional to it. So the masculinist and the proud boys, and on the other end of the spectrum, you have the proud boys that opposes a feminist and refers to an advocate of men's rights and chauvinism, as we'll see. Uh, part of the proud boys, and we'll get to them in a moment, includes an oath swearing ceremony in which newcomers refuse to apologize for creating the modern world here i'm going to go back here now to uh, what we're talking about earlier with uh, the, the matrix so the manosphere i know you're laughing when you see this uh, the, there is the thing it's it's the manosphere it's a collection of websites blogs online forums promoting masculinity misogyny strong opposition to feminism Communities with the manosphere include, but trust me, they're all here, men's rights activists, or even back to the, you know, the tree huggers and what we call the tree huggers and the men's groups of the 80s and, you know, we're going to go out into the woods and beat our drums and um, incels, involuntary celibates, men going their own way, pickup artists, fathers' rights groups, overlaps with the far right and alt right communities. Also been associated with online harassment, implicated in radicalizing men into misogynist beliefs the glorification of violence against women some of it is absolutely juvenile clearly um, male shame fail your attempt to shame me tells me that you are arguing from an emotive not reason etc 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 the manosphere so when if you saw the most recent matrix and have you had your green pill the, the notion of what you got and what you're doing so points here that are that are important in everything else that I'm saying. So the gender is the third support of the triad under the colonial power dynamic. Hence the don't say gay. It's it's another way of obviously saying the same thing that we're said for years. We don't care what you do in, in private as long as what you are doing in public. So that kind of distinction. It's you see where are we dragging that out of from? 
um, which is whatever we might want to say about how you know uh, the, how far quote homosexuality, which we no longer use that expression, we can we now say same sex, um, and we'll talk later about the, the part of the reality here is how we talk about things and what the things is we're talking about, but that this notion of a a, a gender a gender failure in terms of quote homosexuality, um, you don't see that still. We still don't see. It, under the normalization of, let's say, all kinds of, say, genders, uh, gendering possibilities, I, I, I don't think that they are as um, possible as we like to say that they are, which is to say that there's a kind of, again, I use the word liberal, but not in terms of the sense of political, but there's, a, there's an easy way of talking about these sorts of things, the same way we use Jim Crow, um, but, but the reality is something very different. So the parsing of laws impossible to undo preventing of abortion is part of what you're seeing here on the, the left side. It might seem distant and it might seem distinct, um, but the, the success of the alt-right depends on it going undercover in a variety of ways. And, and why in a white male supremacist society, what we're calling heteronormativity, uh, the homosocial must be cordoned off from the homosexual. So what the Texas abortion law means, um, and the interesting thing is, as I said, I said this last week, going up and down 95, which is really a, a supremacist corridor from Woodrow Wilson's uh, uh, car kind of maintenance place to the signs. Um, a variety, must, must be five or six or seven, just going through the state of Delaware and New Jersey, um, pro-abortion, no, sorry, pro-anti-abortion ads mostly Christian, mostly white, not all white. Um, here, this is obvious. So that the other facet of genocide is reproduction and the point of gender division in a political economy. Uh, a couple, a little bit here in a few minutes about the, the function in the movement that serves a really important symbolic role. And I mentioned last week kind of as a side because I'm not really done thinking about it institutions like the Daughters of the Confederacy and how as late as 1915 they were posting uh, images, they were posting Confederate memorials in, of all places, uh, Helena, Montana. In 1915, why were we having a Confederate, Mon Confederate memorial in Montana in 1915 by the Daughters of the, Rep Daughters of the Confederacy? So this notion that the work that is being done in, in the Brown versus the Supreme Court when the desegregation came down and you, you began to see images coming out of Alabama, you don't see the men. What you, what you, and maybe this is the media, maybe this is a specific way, but men tend to keep to the background and the, the carriers of the, I'll say it, public hate are largely gendered women. Now that's going to change when we get here into what I'm going to talk about now in terms of the, the, the more masculinist movements that we're seeing. So, for example, opposing immigration in the white power movement has to do with the number of white people versus the number of other people's babies. And you've heard the expression, what's the expression, uh, uh, anchor baby or uh, ship baby? So similarly, opposing abortion, opposing gay rights, opposing feminism in white power discourse is tied to the reproduction and the birth of white children. We must, those are the 14 words, we must ensure a country, a place, and a time for our white children. Uh, New York Times, when women are the enemy, the intersection of misogyny and white supremacy. Another New York Times, Sisters in Hate, offers a window into women in the white nationalist movement. Uh, the hand sign that they're looking at that you see there, on the, the three fingers is the W and the uh, thumb and the index finger is AP, white people. So the language of diversity, uh, number one, the United States was never founded upon any kind of thing called diversity. You remember the 1790 Nationalization Act, uh, free white persons, not any white person, but a person who was not um, a slave, that is to say somebody who was not Irish, okay, and probably not women. Diversity, no white countries. Diversity, no white cities. Diversity means no white neighborhoods. Diversity means no white people. 
axiom behind any act of civil violence is position the authority, law, or person who gives it cover and authority. Diversity, no. Diversity, no. Diversity, no. Diversity, no. So where does the authority come from this? This is a New York Times title. title. A president's rhetoric about shithole countries, quote, quote, invites dismissal as crude talk, but behind it lie ideas whose power should not be underestimated. And if you've been following this from last week, we have seen this all the way through, as I said, not only from Queen Elizabeth in uh, 1651 with our, her, her, her first in, in enslavement uh, 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 with John Hawkins into the Jamaican country, when you begin to see all the way through in terms of the way the colonials, the way the laws in Virginia, the way uh, the 1619 project starts on this partly, and as I said last week, my only complaint on the 1619 project, it eliminates, it, it makes it binary of white and black when as a matter of fact, the, in the, for 125 years from the, the Genovese and Co Columbus, the enslavement of the indigenous peoples, uh, what, what we call Indians, you know, up and down the East Coast seaboard. That's just not paid attention to. But so the rhetoric about Chittal countries is, is crude talk perhaps, but it's ideas that he himself has been distilling from our own particular history. So the Trump connection and the Trump permission, you know, this is kind of a, obviously it was a satire, it's an image out of who knows where, but one can see um, the gendering and the politics and the religion that if you're looking for the kinds of things that give permission to violence, these are they. So, again, the New York Times, how white nationalists learn to love Donald Trump. I'm not gonna read Shelley's, so I'm not gonna read uh, Chet's, uh, but you can see that for yourself. But Donald Trump once went from being a secret Jew, now he has more white power support than any mainstream candidate. How did that happen? Trump was never about populism or nationalism, but the interests of working America, always about the contours of our national community, who belongs and who doesn't, who counts and who shouldn't who can wield power, and who must be subjected to it. An, an aside, I mentioned last week that uh, in terms of uh, white nations, there are six, six nations that were founded by constitution to be white. The United States was one of them, Rhodesia was one, South Africa is another, Australia was one, and New Zealand. So in 2007, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was passed by a majority of 144 states in favor, four votes against Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States. So the kind of the, 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 shiny, the shiny object of the birth certificate is an example of what we talked about earlier, that don't pay attention to that, but look at the other things behind it. This is a different aside, and this is more about what's happening now in terms of the, the future. Uh, Trump's sleight of hand, shouting fraud and pocketing donors' cash for the future. Okay. A 70s uh, poem by a black nationalist, the revolution will be televised. Transition will not be televised, he says. So now the, we begin to move more directly into what we're talking about, American white supremacist groups exploiting a kind of international connection. And again, this is the language that one hears when one starts talking about uh, global this and global that. Uh, every one of you senators and every one of you congressmen out there know that we are watching. Well, the notion that the revolution is in fact being tele tele televised, and this was the whole point of 9-11, or one of the points, why this happened at the time that it did, so that it would be on all, absolute, every media possible on that. So who are these groups? I mean, you hear it in the news and we don't have time today to talk about it, but the white nationalists and white supremacist groups, and again, just notice that um, nationalism and supremacism might seem to be different and, and it, white nationalists might espouse a kind of a difference. Um, a white nationalists might say, we're just looking for a place of our own, uh, but there's very often a slide into because we are better than these other people. 
So who they are, they're the three percent, they're the oath keeper. Now, this is what you want to think about when you're reading about the capital coup and you hear these particular different groups, the three percent, the three percent goes back to the Revolutionary War where it was, it's kind of estimated that only 3% of the citizens actually um, were armed in, in the war and defended the, the colonies. So that they're using that 3% now in the same kind of way. Oath Keepers, the Boogaloo Boys, uh, Adam Waffen, which is a European-German group, Generation Identity, which is mostly European millennial groups doing the same sort of thing, um, not necessarily white supremacy, but as a matter of fact, uh, their own nationalist supremacy. And the Russian imperial movement, which is humorous, it offered training to American organizers of the Charlottesville riots. 14 words and the others from what the ethno state that we've talked about. So you see these and you will look at this and you will suddenly say, oh, I see these on the news. The, you know, the peacekeepers, the 3%. Canada, for example, uh, I'm going to come back here. Canada, for example, has recently declared these folks as persona non grata in their country because of their violence. Accelerationalism. If uh, there's a Eric Land uh, uh, has a website called Dark Enlightenment, and one of the terms that comes up in this is called accelerationism that it, uh, it's it rests on an idea that the Enlightenment is failing, has failed, and that until we eliminate the, this kind of this liberalized notion of you know, uh, gun countries and democracy and human rights, uh, nothing is going to get done and the government's going to continue to collapse. So you can say that Putin, for example, um, is working with that kind of, that, you know, as one of the headlines this week said, his argument with the Western history for the last 500 years is to go back to, to undo that back to a, a method where he himself, as the King of France says, he is the state. So it rests on the idea is that Western governments are irreparably corrupt. That the best thing white supremacists can do is to accelerate their demise by sowing chaos and creating political tension. So it's kind of guerrilla warfare, but it's, it might seem like it's random and purpose, purposeless guerrilla warfare, but it is simply it's, it's doing, it's picking up the weapons that you have. It's like the Boogaloo Boys. Take this big rock, that's one of their signs, take this big rock and th throw it at any government building. So it's, it takes a page from the Timothy McVeigh, simply take manure and, and make a bomb out of the thing. Take what you have. And accelerated ideas have been cited in mass shooters' manifestos, explicitly, explicitly in the case of New Zealand killer, Christchurch who are frequently referenced in white supremacist web, for, web forums and, and chat rooms. So, so uh, the Great Replacement, it, it's interesting that all one needs to do, and Jenny Thomas does this, and you'll see more about this, all you have to do is, is put great in front of something, and suddenly you have a category, a thing. As fears of the Great Replacement spread across the Western world, so does violence from lone actors. And it's just 2018. Six mass attacks motivated by great replacement ideas. Um, besides Christchurch, two American synagogues, El Paso Walmart, of all things, synagogue in Halle, Germany, two Sisha bars in Hanau, Germany, where the shooter was believed to have been targeting Muslim immigrants. Uh, to a point to this, uh, we always talk about uh, the holy wars and uh, you know the kind of the Muslim uh, jihad. This is originally a Christian. This was the Pope Urban II in 1096 when he says, Deus vult, it is, it is God's will that we have the Crusades. So while we need to think about it in terms of the, the, the religious component of our own Western colonialism, it's not always pleasant to think about, but it's also there. You will not replace us. And then you see, oh, this part, Identity Europa. What are they doing here? This is the United States. Um, men, 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 men. So to conclude this particular section before we move on to the is documenting hate. This is a, a the NPR was was had the uh, what do you call it, a video on this. The new American Nazis. Axiom again, behind every social action is the shadow of a law. At the risk of simply 
uh, beating this into, into our heads is we go back to the first act of the first Congress of the United States, and people will say, well, no, but countries change. Well, okay, but the point is, is that there are still laws on the books that have not, and we saw this last week with uh, Governor Northam, what we call laws that have fallen into desuetude. I mean, there is, when you look at the Virginia, Virginia birth registration laws, Yes, you say, well, but nobody, nobody follows the law now, and it's, it, so it's still there, but whatever. There are laws on the book, even in our own Congress, even in our own Constitution, and in the 18 constitutions that were changed after the war, Civil War uh, to simply uh, to make legal apartheid in these, in these states, including, again, Oregon, Washington State, and California. White supremacy, the most lethal threat to the U.S., Homeland Security says we've been talking about that. Uh, three percenters, we talked about that, 2008. An accurate historical claim that only 3% of, Amer of Americans fought in the Revolutionary War against the British. And they wouldn't have been Americans, of course, they would have been colonialists. What, well, I'll be interested, so you can just, I have a lot of these slides, a lot of it's repetitive, these are headlines from different places, just so that we can begin to see this is what, if you're paying attention to the news anymore, this is what you are seeing. Um, so the new face of white supremacy is male. It goes beyond systemic racism that minorities have long fa faced. It dreams of a world in which minorities are either subservient and non-existent. And I'll say it, in this particular world, women are included as a minority, which they're not. It's a public face often that seems male. It's the homosocial. This is the good old boys network. If there's an issue with homosexuality, it's because they're not homosocial. Their power, they have, they have dropped status, if you want to put it that particular way. Following Charlottesville, Spencer Kessler, and Spencer, we don't have the time to talk about him, but he's an influential man on this. Kessler and Cantwell, another white supremacist, found libel and deadly unite the right rally. More than a dozen of the nation's most prominent white supremacists and hate groups conspired to intimidate, harass, or commit acts of violence during 2017's deadly unite the right. A jury decides the men and their racist organizations should pay $26 million in damage. Richard Spencer, Jason Kessler. So. And so in, in post Charlottesville, uh, it's kind of, a, it's post, it's what I'm calling post empire melancholia. The narratives of white victimization replaces the various lost cause narratives. And the lost cause narrative is uh, a way in which the Confederacy, and this goes back to, it, it, honestly, it was, it was designed as a way of somehow permitting, having a conversation around Confederates who were by law traitors and, and, and who were treasonous and who were in court for that. Um, but how could they be welcomed back into any kind of discourse? Um, there's a little bit of this happening in the current uh, assault on Ukraine when you, now you say, well, this, the objective is now finished, so now we're, so there's like a, it's like a little bit of an off ramp that's kind of happening here, but it's, it's, it's distracting from what is actually the, the thing. So the lost cause of Confederacy was a way in which, oh, well, they were, they were brave when they fought, and um, so the lost cause is that it was, it was all about uh, Southern valor and, and, and Southern commitment to individuality, et cetera. And even as Patrick Henry said, uh, give me liberty or give me death, this is a different issue, but the liberty that, that he wanted was that they were to hold slaves. So what I'm calling, in this post-Empire melancholia, you have narratives of white victimization. We, we, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Yes, there is the sentimentalization again of gender and children, uh, which plays itself out from Roe versus Wade all the way through. So the march against white genocide, um, going to go up and down the streets of uh, 95 through through New Jersey, and this is what you see. Okay. okay, these last two slides. How white is white? We talked a little bit last week about how white people became white, how the Jews became white, how Italians became white, when black people became white, when the Irish finally became white, and the fact that I, an Irish pub was the similar, it was, was in the 1840s, the, the equivalent of a gay bar. It was where these kind of people could be safe. It's a simple way of putting that. But that accelerationism has many variants. 
goes back to Karl Marx and it comes to white supremacists and other far right extremists. You see modern society is irredeemable and believe that it should be pushed to collapse so that a fascist society built on ethno-nationalism can take its place. So Colin Woodward talks about 11 different Americas. And this is from the Business Insider and I can get to that reference if you'd like to it. We'll see this map again and we'll see it right here. This is easier. The Northwest Territorial Imperative was one of the earliest um, whites only and you still see motions up in this area here for the 51st state of Jefferson. And uh, what would you do? We, may, we may pass on this material and say, well, this is, you know, you know, this is somebody's fancy, but it's it's a real thing, and it's been they've been doing this since since the 1940s. So if you googled uh, X, if you googled the state, great state of Jefferson, you'd see its great steel is two X's, which is to say cancel culture in terms of the of the government, uh, the federal government territory, kind of what we have now. You have the Republic of New Africa, Malcolm X's black ethno state, back to the 60s, uh, and then you have Nuevo Mexico, which. Uh, it, the interesting thing about white America, white America, is that we got all of this land from from Mexico. We took it all this land from Mexico, and these persons were not, by definition, um, supremacists from our people. So, white supremacy and law enforcement: the historical link and buttress. Very quickly, and I'm going to try and move on here because I would do want to make sure I get through this. Uh, this is Rolling Stones: the Enemy Within. Aaron, you can see here the, the hand gesture. Um, this is a different one. This is the BrennanCenter.org, and if you want to find uh, legitimate information on the topic, hidden in plain sight, racism, white supremacy, and far-right militancy, the government's response to known connections of law enforcement to violent, racist, and military groups, militant groups, strikingly insufficient. Key judgments, I'm going to read one. White supremacist presence among law enforcement personnel concern due to the access they may pause possess to restrict areas, restricted areas vulnerable to sabotage to elected officials, protected persons whom they could see as potential targets for violence. In addition, white supremacist infiltration of law enforcement can result in other abuses of authority, passive tolerance of racism. One active agent writes, I was an FBI agent who infiltrated white supremacists. Too many local police don't take the far right seriously, or they actively sympathize with them. Again, the language that we're looking at about, uh, it's, it's viral, it's cancerous, it's metastasized, it's medical. The other epidemic, white supremacists in law and law enforcement. And these various headlines that you're seeing are from different organizations. This is the ACLU. Law enforcement agencies have been breeding grounds for far right ideology for decades. And it's not just an American problem, and it's not. We'll talk a little bit about uh, Germany and Europe a bit. Um, what, what we may not always know, and I'll take a moment here. American policing historically began in South Carolina in 1704 with this, this, uh, basically the slave vigilante uh, uh, trade where every community would, began to have its own group of persons. 1704, uh, this is one year between before Virginia's 1705's um, race law in which any non-white person is real estate. That's what the law says. The expression they use is real estate. But that American policing starts with Carolina slave catchers. The, the first uh, the police group, if you want legal, uh, urban group is probably Boston in about 1830, but so for the first hundred years before that you had these ad hoc, and here you have the North Carolina Slave Patrol. I name, do swear that I will search as a searcher for guns, swords, and other weapons among the slaves in my district. It's curious that certain kinds of people were not entitled to these guns. Faithfully and as privately as I can, discharge the trust reposed in me as the law directs to the best of my power so help me God. I love this as privately as I can. Slave patrols, civil war, Jim Crow, redeemer governments, white citizen councils, civil rights movements, racial profiles, stop and frisk on the current Black Lives Matter. What's not mentioned? The law. Racist strands in policing run deep in America. What's not mentioned? The law. Oh, and um, incarceration. President Wilson, 
The white men of the South were aroused by the mere instinct of self-preservation until at last there had sprung into existence a great Ku Klux Klan, a veritable empire of the South, to protect the Southern country. And this is the man who'd segreg de who segregated Washington, D.C., whose bridge, um, Woodrow Wilson Bridge, basically ends in a dumping ground, it wasn't a burial ground, a dumping ground for Virginia enslaved persons. Um, this is a young officer in Michigan who was taken out for her, her trial um, to become a police and her mentor says you need to uh, do something, you need to arrest somebody, you need to do some violence to somebody. Uh, he doesn't even need to have done anything. He said, I will back you up. That's on NPR. The FBI, 2006 FBI memo warns law enforcement and the military they're the targets of an active campaign by white supremacists. Since 2000, law enforcement officials with alleged connections to white supremacist groups exposed in Alabama, California, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Louisiana, Michigan, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, Washington, and West Virginia. Hundreds of federal, state, and local law enforcement officials participating in racist, nativist, and sexist social media activity. This was like two weeks ago. This was the, the, that it came out. This is an older, this is two years ago. But this is, it, it was just published. DC police investigating a lieutenant for alleged ties to right wing extremist group. And again, these are the shiny objects, and you can easily find a zillion images similar to this. The point I think I'm trying to make is that the extans expansiveness of this and the notion of that, that we should probably be paying more attention to this. Um, Frank Meek, how white supremacist cops use ghost skins to stay hidden. And here you see the man's number has been erased or at least covered. Meek opened up about his experience with ghost skins, a practice white supremacists use to hide overt displays of their beliefs to blend in. Nationalist leaders with ties to law enforcement would often vet members of the neo-Nazi groups he was affiliated with, and some of his former associates are now policemen. Again, when you see these, when you see them all lined up this particular way, you go, oh, so this is what they're talking about. This is what they're talking about. This is what they're talking about. The FBI report goes, if the government knew that Al-Qaeda or ISIS had infiltrated American law enforcement agencies, it would have undoubtedly instituted a nationwide effort to identify them and neutralize the threat. Yet white, sorry, white supremacists and far-right militants have committed far more attacks and killed more people in the U.S. over the last 10 years than any foreign ter terrorist moment. The FBI regards them as the most lethal domestic threat. This was federal Christopher, Christopher Ray just very recently. White supremacists seek affiliation with law enforcement to further their goals. And one can find, one can, and I can give references to this, I don't want to spend a lot of time reading these reports. They should be read. I would go back to the Brandon Foundation uh, how does this turn out in practice? Teen charged in killings of BLM protesters considered himself a militia member. You see Rittenhouse walk up to an armored police vehicle armed like that and chat with officers. A police officer pops out of one vehicle's hatch, tosses bottles to Rittenhouse associates, members of an armed militia. We appreciate you guys, we really do. This is a New York Times visual. The young looking Rittenhouse, and I thought, why are they saying that? He's under the legal age for firearm ownership and was carrying an assault rifle. Instead of stopping him and asking for proof of age, the police gave him water and an attaboy. ACLU, Rittenhouse didn't act alone. Law enforcement must be held accountable. Uh, and just to pause, uh, I live in Washington, and folks who may not uh, know much of the history of what's been going on in the last year, after the George uh, Floyd murder, 
um, the, the National Guard was, I don't know how we say it, but so in front of the uh, Lincoln Memorial, you had rack upon rack upon rack of these um, armor, heavily armored persons uh, in very uh, just uh, militaristic poses. Um, and you see the same kind of thing is that when there, when there was that kind of threat pause, you, the, the, the militia would be called out. So while Rittenhouse was not found guilty, he was not the only one whose conduct should be scrutinized. Uh, officers enabled and encouraged predominantly white right-wing armed civilians and militia groups, creating a situation in which tensions escalated and people were killed, which is the issue we're going to be coming to here in a moment when we get to the, to the capital coup. Yeah. Very quickly, that was, that was simply law enforcement. This is military. Harry Truman desegregates the armed forces in 48. Uh, the U.S. military is a centralized hierarchical organization, so orders from the top can quickly be implemented throughout the armed services while law enforcement is highly decentralized. One of the ongoing um, refrains and stories around uh, the Capitol coup and the six months leading up to that was the, 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 the chief of staff in terms of the military. And uh, you, you, you probably catch echoes of it through Pelosi and talking to the military. And, were there safeguards in place in case there was anything being done at, a, at that particular level? So the decentralization of the military makes it much easier for extremist groups to recruit police and harder for departments to remove officers that join them. I want you to see here the sailors with their Ku Klux Klan. For much of the 20th century, the Klan actively recruited members of the armed forces without hindrance. Dozens of Navy soldiers and sailors in uniform attending a Klan rally in the summer of 23, where they were photographed holding their robes. Top Center, Timothy McVeigh, members of his Army platoon in 1988 during infantry training at Fort Benning, Georgia. He carries out the 1995 Oklahoma City burning at Murrah Center that killed 168 people. He was an Army veteran who served in the Persian War Gulf. He had taken inspiration from the white supremacist novel, The Turner Diaries, which continues to hold sway. So you see, this is not, well, it's really now, this is not a new problem that we are facing. Navy kicks out alleged recruiter for neo-Nazi group Adamoff Division after an investigation. It's not exactly like this man is hiding this, is he? U.S. Army soldier charged with plotting white supremacist terrorist attack. It's not exactly like they're hiding it. So the issue that the New York Times asks, why does the U.S. military celebrate white supremacy? It's time to rename bases for American heroes, not racist traitors. And this is the New York Times talking, okay. Uh, the white supremacist who murdered nine black churchgoers dispensed with the fiction that the Confederate battle flag was an innocuous symbol of Southern pride. A murderer's manifesto describes the killing as the start of a race war. And the, def the Defense Department's actual history acknowledges that the federal embrace of the Jim Crow legal system undermined the country's readiness for war, destroyed morale, introduced black recruits to a brand of hardcore racism many had not experienced in civil life. And as the military opened more and more such bases, the history notes, quote, it actually spread federally sponsored segregation into areas where it had never been existed with the force of law. Within two months of uh, assuming office, Woodrow Wilson had segregated Washington, D.C. So to end this section in respect, and I have about 20 minutes left to, to bring this to a close. Fatal police violence by race and state in the U.S. 1980 to 2019. I'm not going to read this, but I'll say in red, this study examines the presence and extent of underreporting of police violence in U.S. government-run vital registration, offers a method for correcting underreporting in these data sets, presents revised estimates of deaths due to police violence in the U.S. Their names project, 28,000 people from January 1st, 2000, to George Floyd. And again, out of respect, 
the blue line of matter. The flag itself emerges around 2014 as the Blue Lives Matter movement grows in prominence, intended apparently as a response to Black Lives Matter. It grows out of a series of incidents across the nation in which police officers were killed in the line of duty. It can't happen here. My subjects throughout these last two webinars, and again, I thank you uh, who have been here with me. Um, all the errors are mine, and whatever good might come out of it, I can send you the reference. But there are, there are two topics. It's, it's the subject itself, the shiny objects, and the way that we talk about these things. Um, the Capitol riot, for example, the Capitol coup, for example, the insurrection. Uh, f for the first few weeks of the assault on the Ukraine, we kept hearing about the Ukraine-Russian war. And I kept going, raising my hand, going, "Excuse me, this is not the, the, this is not the, the Ukraine is not in a, in a war." Uh, so how we talk about the issues that we're talking about? Uh, here you have a Trump supporter holding a thin blue line version of the American flag at the Capitol. So the, the topic here has come full, full around to specifically looking at the involvement of civil, political, uh, formal police and military personnel involved in, choose your word, insurrection, coup, riot. Uh, I'm calling it a coup because, as a matter of fact, uh, the, it's, the, it's the word the New York Times uses and the its predecessors, for example, and there's one in, that uses the word coup in the Wilmington coup in 1896, uh, which became, you know, the, well, they just called it a fracas of some kind. Former Capitol Police Officer Butch Jones says, racism is a huge problem among the Capitol Police. Some of us call Capitol Hill the last plantation. Our friend David Duke, late 70s, founded this, National Association for the Advancement of White People. This particular one is 1918, but Duke back to the 70s. Jamie Raskin, the presence of current and former police in the Capitol attack was irrefutable proof of the threat, he writes to Christopher Ray. Well, we'll see. Retired police officer, Thomas Webster, attacking a Capitol police officer here. Jacob Fraker, Thomas Robertson, Rocky Mountain Police. Officer Fraker writes on his Facebook, not like I did anything illegal, as he's standing in the Capitol in front of the building. And my second subject then is how the pull of a familiar narrative, and we were talking about this more last week, about we, we know white supremacists when we see it because they're always groups and, and they're white people and they're marching with signs. So there's a narrative already that is we are prejudged to understand that. So you see it here in the headline, Trump supporters who attempted the coup at the U.S. Capitol flaunted racist and hateful symbols. Well, um, they, they could say f f flaunts the flag maybe, but uh, one, one has to be careful with that particular kind of language. The mob of rioters carried Confederate flags, hung nooses, and paraded white supremacist symbols as they violently breached the Capitol. That part was true. Marine veteran, ex-cop, pleads guilty. Now, again, these are all the shiny objects. It's easy to kind of pick and choose these various people who were doing this. This man says, America has spoken. You can't stop millions of people. Cannot stop it. Can't. It's impossible. America has a voice. We give them power, Len says in his video. He also claims he loved the boys in blue, but that there was, quote, no way that they could hold us back. Oath Keepers. From the start, uh, the Oath Keepers recruited military and law enforcement. The name Oath Keepers is a call back to the oath that such individuals swore to defend the Constitution for all enemies, foreign and domestic. So there's a kind of an easy tie-in between law enforcement, military, and the Oath Keepers. It claims to have 10,000s and thousands of members, although research says mm, maybe 5,000. But the Department uh, of Justice charges 11 Oath Keepers, including the leader, with seditious conspiracy in January 6th. largest uh, far-right anti-government groups in the U.S. today. 
And so here you're seeing uh, again, this is not just uh, this is not just racialized or nationalized, it's anti-government. So, from a high point officer charged with capital she's up here in, in, in the zoo. The, Laura Steele, she, she's an oath keeper who's been charged as part of a sweeping conspiracy. On her part of her application, I have 13 years of experience in law enforcement in North Carolina. I served as a canine officer and a SWAT team member. A man wearing a vest with the Oath Keepers logo protesting the Georgia election results. So the, the, now to start theorizing this, to, put, to, to bring a little bit of this, some closure to this, so what do we say about all of this? So the disproportionate numbers of current and former military personnel arrested in the Capitol attack. Active military personnel veterans are overrepresented among the first 150 people to be arrested and that changed. So analysis by Pentagon records and court proceedings show that 21 of the 150, 14% are current or former members of the U.S. military. That's more than double the percentage of service men and women and veterans in the adult U.S. population. Proud Boys, of more than 530 arrests, prosecutors also have now charged at least 37 members or associates of the Proud Boys, a group with a history of violence the one that Donald Trump famously said, stand back and stand by. Number of capital riots, riot arrests, military, law enforcement, and government rises to 52. Most were retired, but at least 10 were still actively employed. So 52 active, retired military, law enforcement, or government are among the over 400 suspects arrested for alleged actions. Nearly one in five defendants served in the military. At least 27 of those charged, or 20%, have served or are currently serving in the U.S. military. To put that number in perspective, only about 7% of all Americans, adults, are military veterans. Several veterans charged with violent entry and disorderly conduct. One of these is Larry Randall Block, the Air Force veteran, photographed in a military-style helmet. He posted on Facebook that he was preparing, quote, for a second civil war. Brock posts, we are now under occupation by a hostile governing force. This is Turner Diaries. This is Oath Keepers. Mr. Brock, armed force veteran aimed, quote, to take hostages during the U.S. Capitol riot. Social media posts from Brock, patriots on the Capitol, patriots storming in, men with guns needing to shoot their way in. The gendering of all this is interesting. So a year since the January 6th attack on the Capitol recently, the Capitol has been attacked, uh, broken into twice. This is August 24th, 1814 when the British burned the capital during the 1812 war. That was then, this is now. From the U.S. Attorney's Office of the District of Columbia, one year since the January 6th, based on the public records, this is a snapshot of the investigation as of Thursday, December 30th, 2021. Criminal charges. Arrests made, more than 725 defendants have been arrested in nearly all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Criminal charges, more than 225 defendants charged with assaulting, resisting, impeding officers or employees. 75 individuals have been charged with using a deadly or dangerous weapon or causing serious bodily injury to an officer. Approximately 140 police officers were assaulted January 6th including at 80 U.S. Capitol Police, 60 from the Metropolitan Police Department. Ten individuals arrested on a series of charges, 75 defendants charged with entering a restricted place, 640 defendants charged with entering or remaining in a restricted place, 40 defendants charged with conspiracy, either A, conspiracy to obstruct a congressional proceeding, conspiracy to obstruct law enforcement during a civil disorder, 
conspiracy to injure an officer, or some combination of the three. Pleas. Approximately 165 individuals have pleaded guilty to a variety of federal charges. Approximately 145 pleaded guilty to misdemeanors. Six of these pleaded guilty to felonies have pled to charges related to assaults on law enforcement. Four face statutory maximum of 20 years or more in prison. Citizens from all around the country have provided valuable assistance in identifying individuals in connection. The FBI continues to seek the public's help in identifying more than 350 individuals still in addition, believed to have committed violent acts on the Capitol grounds, including over 250 who assaulted police officers. So in all this detailed breakdown from the DA's office, it surprises me that while it mentions the number of police officers assaulted, it makes no mention of the number of the military, active or retired, or law enforcement, active or retired, who are charged or convicted. So this is a, a reprise to last week, white nationalists hiding in plain sight, that the US Capitol riot police have long history of aiding neo-Nazis and extremists. Johnson, Professor Johnson, Georgetown expert, testified in Congress. She found that since 2009, more than 100 police departments in 49 states have faced scandals involving officers making overtly racist statements. We're going to move on from the Boogaloo Boys because I want to finish this. We're not alone. Germany has woke to a problem of far-right extremism in its military special forces, but the threat of neo-Nazi infiltration of state institutions is much broader. 29 German police officers suspended for sharing ugliest neo-Nazi images in WhatsApp groups. And I, we're, we're moving here to the, actually if I, had, if I had a political point to make, we're moving here to the thing, because I'm gonna come back to the Weimar Republic and to the, the years after the war, after, after the First World War where uh, Germany in defeat was, very, was, was humiliated by, by Europe and what came out of through the Weimar Republic and followed into World War II was an attempt to recompense that. So if you want to talk about it, masculine compensation, possibly. But so when former Governor Schwarzenegger speaks out uh, about the assault and he compares it to Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass in Nazi Germany in 1938, why is this important? Um, it's important because we must remember that Adolf Hitler who was the man languishing in prison for the failed putsch in, uh, in the Bavaria, uh, he was democratically elected after, from the Weimar Republic. He was democratically elected, and we see that here. 40,000 vote for Hitler in record German poll. Two million no's counted. Picturesque, Adolf Hitler, helm of German Reich, after years of tempestuous efforts. So whatever, ask him again, whatever authority he did not have before then, once he became, elect, uh, became uh, elected, he was able to dismantle laws, he was able to do whatever he needed to do. And just on a kind of a spur, I looked up um, the, the world of coups since 1950. There have been 475 since 1950. Okay. How many exactly, 475? And of those, how many of those have been successful? Well, it can happen here. Again, I had this slide last week, an enormous portrait of George Washington hangs alongside swastika banners, American flags. And this is 1939, um, and it's stop Jewish domination of Christian America. So it can happen here, but it can happen here. Coups do happen. 475 happened. Where has it happened in the United States? We'll talk about that. In the Chicago Project for Security and Threats, only one other statement won overwhelming support among 21 million committed insurrectionists. Almost two thirds of them, quote, agreed, African and American people or Hispanic people in our country will eventually have more rights than whites. Slicing the data another way, respondents who believed in the great replacement theory, regardless of their views on anything else, were nearly four times as likely as those who did not to support the violent removal of the president. Four times as likely as those who did not to support the violent removal of the president. It's the white thing. 
Mr. Putin still trying for empire. More than 50 police officers were hurt at um, the insurrection at the Capitol, in which one officer and four protesters were killed. Would Americans ever support a coup? 40% now say yes. New York Times. That percentage jumped significantly since 2017 and includes more than half the Republicans. Recently, now this is from the Atlantic Monthly. Recently, for the first time, the United States was added to a list of backsliding democracies by the Stockholm-based Internet, sorry, International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. Similar organizations have also reported that the United States democratic institutions have eroded. The United States added to a list of backsliding democracies. The Revolution of 1719, the Newburgh Conspiracy, the Shays Rebellion, Door Rebellion, Brooks Baxter War, the Battle of Liberty Place, the overthrow of the Hawaiian Gulf Kingdom, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the revolutions, these are the coups, this is they don't even mention here the uh, the Wilmington coup in which elected s civilians were shot, killed, the building burnt, and taken over by white uh, by whites in the town. So coups do happen here. In the mayhem of January 6th, at least 151 police officers suffered injuries, broken bones, concussions, chemical burns. This is the Guardian. A significant minority of Americans say that they could support a military takeover of the U.S. government, Washington Post, from 2010 to 2021, from 40 to 51 percent. Republicans, not so much government, not so much Democrats. Another guardian. Trump's next coup has already begun. January 6th with practice. Donald Trump's GOP is much better positioned to subvert the next election. This is in the news this week. I don't think I need to reference it much. Uh, Robert, that's what I have. Again, I want to thank everyone for being part of my attempt to talk about these particular topics. There are many good places to start reading and that each one of us can do a part that we need to keep our country safe. Thank you. Uh, I'm willing to take questions, Robert, if you have some. Well, yeah, I sure do, Edward. Thank you. That was awesome. As usual, boy, really covered a lot of thought provoking. <laughs> as, you, as you were talking about some of these concepts, I was my mind was kind of thinking about that. And then you're off on to the next one. And I'm, I'm still processing what you were talking about a few minutes earlier on some of these I topics. I do apologize for that. No, 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 it's not your fault. What I mean is you you were talking about things like, wow, that's actually interesting. I never I never like you were talking about the um, the the participants in the um, the riot, the January 6th event, and you know, oh, I never saw that data before. Gee, why is that? You know, da, 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 and then kind of processing that, and then you're on to the next um, topic. No, I meant that in a, a complimentary way. It's just this is a very, this this is the type of presentation you have to kind of um, think about this and kind of let this kind of ferment in your mind all the different uh, this, nuances this, and stuff. This is a 10 week course, I think, at least. Right? Oh, yeah, you know, so you're really bringing up a lot of interesting things. So, yeah, there, of course, were some. Uh, questions. Let's see. First one came in. This was a pretty early on. It said, I'm sincerely, sincerely curious, Edward. I fully agree that organized religion bears tremendous responsibility for slavery and systematic racism in the U.S. How do you see the relatively recent decline in influence of traditional organized religion affecting the current situation? What about the fairly rigid socioeconomic caste system in which roughly half the Americans, both uh, POC and people of color and white, are both trapped than we usually acknowledge. 
Um, there are about four questions there. I, I thank you for them. <laughs> I could, Robert, as Robert knows, I have probably done lectures on these. Uh, people ask me whether Christianity is a colonizing religion, and I say, of course it is. You know, when, 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 when the words are put into Jesus' mouth, go and make disciples of all nations, there you have it right there. Now, what has been done to whatever these words were, how they were said, uh, but the fact that this religious presence has been used uh, for this effect is, is perfectly clear and evident. Uh, it, it, I do find it remarkable as I talk to even black activists that I know, um, how and even now, for example, in Akama, when you when when you start talking to the indigenous on the plant on the at the uh, Akama, what do, what do you call it, Pueblo, um, they start talking about their Christian roots. And the one uh, one woman said, and she said, "See this over here with the the image of of hell. This these are the Spaniards burning in hell for what they have done to our people. And what the Spanish had, had done to their people is essentially was to convert them to Christianity. Uh, so it's one tool." Uh, that I think is beginning to change and diminish. Okay. What about more of a personal question? And this comes up in some of the talks that you do from different people. What, like, what's your thought as, like, are you optimistic about the future with all? I mean, obviously things aren't going to change next week or next month, but, you know, if you look out 10 years from now, 25 years from now, are you confident that we'll eventually get some of this resolved or oh boy it's gonna really gonna be an uphill battle or are you kind of neutral <laughs> what's your what's your outlook on all this <laughs> if you don't mind me asking you a personal question well no we are we're, we're here doing the work and because we are here doing the work and because there were other people in other places doing that this particular work okay i mean when someone says oh well you want to cancel culture well yes there are some cultures that need to be canceled oh so you you're a member of the woke culture yes uh, you don't want to spend your entire life sleeping so uh, we, we really don't have the luxury of, of thinking about, uh, and again, I put myself in the situation, I should, should have paused at the beginning in a moment of silence for Ukraine. Uh, most of us in my hearing have it far better off than, than, than these persons. We can only do what we can do to dismantle empire in the various ways in which we find it. Is it largely commodity? Is it largely capitalism? I, that, uh, that I see us going, um, capitalism is, is for me what has to change. There's also an earlier question. This is interesting. Someone asks, that's kind of a longer question, but I'll, I'll summarize it. They basically said, hey, right now everyone's kind of focused on Ukraine um, here in the United States. Well, that, if that situation drags on for months or years, is, how would that impact um, moving forward on some of these other issues? Which I guess is a valid question because if we're busy, I mean, yeah, we should be helping Ukraine, I think, in my opinion, but if we are focus on that it may take some steam away not that you can't do more than one thing at a time but i, I do you have any thoughts on that? i thought that was an interesting I do. I mean, I, question I want, to, I want to go back to uh to hussein i want to go back to 1994-1995 and weapons of mass destruction and I, honestly that we, we are still seeing uh, a white people's war happening here um, and so the parts of the world that are not white that are so the non um, the non how do i say it the non colon this is the, the colonizers warring against and amongst themselves. You're right, and it does distract from all the, it, it distracts from uh, equity and a larger situation that needs to be addressed. Okay. And then this also was an earlier comment slash question said, wow, never thought of this before, but your discussion on Grant brought to mind, is there any evidence that the 1965 Blake Edward film, The Great Race was an intentional assault on Grant's concept in coinage. That was the era of great hopeful strides in racial justice efforts. I'm not familiar with that film, The Great Race. I don't know if you've seen oh, the yeah, Blake Edwards yeah, yeah. 1956. And I'm going to probably say yes, because as a matter of fact, the people were, or, well, people to make these are much smarter than the people of us who view them. So I would think about, I'm going to go back and look at that. And thanks for that. But then this is my point. My point I made about earlier about uh, Great Gatsby and Tom Buchanan and Fitzgerald. Oh, you know, you get if if any of, if anybody's in school and they're taking American studies or the, even American literature, which is all white. Thank you very much. Most of it still. You get a book like Great Gatsby, and and it's all about uh, um, profligacy. I'll say it that way. Uh, in in New York in the twenties, they never mention they never mention. Uh, the prohibition, you know, the thing is littered with uh, drinking from start to finish. 
So it's what's not being said. And Thomas Buchanan just simply talks about, well, the great race, or excuse me, the, you know, the great, great race, and probably, you know, the rise of the colored people, et cetera, et cetera. But it's so those kinds of comments that if you read Great Gatsby with that particular eye, it's saturated with the racialism of that particular period. OK. And then I'm not familiar with this topic. And again, I, it's really interesting reading the questions and comments. People like sometimes I just have to kind of consolidate them. But the, there were actually two different people that asked about how this relates to abortion rights. And basically, well, how come you know some people are um, opposed to abortion but yet they're also at the same time racist and you know that certain pop, certain segments of the population are growing faster than others and how is that reconciled with Robert, uh, abortion that doesn't surprise me in the lightest because as a matter of fact i i, I would say to and, and why i would say i myself have not had an abortion i don't know i know women who have i can't speak to this but i will say very specifically that if they're going to dismantle laws to prohibit, to if they're going to put it positively, if they're going to ensure, as in the 1986 Handmaid's Tale, which is the first novel I taught at Georgetown, that any child is brought to term, the social order has got to be in place to care for this particular life. Okay. Now, uh, and as a matter of fact, racism and abortion in this sense, because the point that I was making about advertising through New Jersey and Connecticut, um, the, the babies that are put up there as proof for there is a God, are white babies. Mm -hmm. What about um, another question? So a topic that's in the discussion a lot is the critical race theory. And regardless of whether you're um, in favor or opposed to that, it's kind of taking on like another um, subset, this whole idea of now governments can go in and uh, limit what's taught about certain subjects, which is, you know, it's, it's related because, yeah, it's, they're, focusing on the critical race theory, but you know, that really could apply to anything. Um, do, is that something that you see moving forward that we get more of this? Because that, to me, that like to think a couple of years ago that a school district could kind of outlaw <laughs> talking about some topic um, across the board would be kind of shocking to me, but this seems to be something that's getting momentum. Well, critical race theory is, is, is not a thing. It's taught in law school and it's not what you're hearing. What we're, what we're talking about here is simply uh, what I would put it, uh, uh, unscrubbing a white history. The fact that the fact that George uh, that George Washington had 123 slaves, Thomas Jefferson had 600, Madison had had 123, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Electoral College was designed to support enslavement power. D.C. was designed to be a show of slavery. That is simply the kind of history that I, you can go right now. You can go to the Encyclopedia Britannica. You can go to Wikipedia. You can go to any encyclopedia and look up D.C. You won't find that. That's all I'm asking. Mm -hmm. now, and that's what they're calling critical race theory, uh, which is which is shoulder, which is bolstering a certain kind of again white privilege. Jefferson didn't say it. Madison didn't say it. But when Jefferson was walking down Central Market a few blocks from the, the then White House, um, examining the fruits and vegetables and the enslaved persons that he would later buy, that's the privilege. The but but are there privilege. are there any other contexts where a school oh, yes. uh, government uh, uh, entity can limit what's taught about a particular topic? Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with the education Google, system, Google, so I don't know. Google critical race theory and and medicine. Okay, this is now beginning to move into medicine. The the doctors cannot address the differences. And I had a slide last week um, that in 76 percent that in um, that <clears throat> all all black zip codes are were probably 76 percent more more likely not to have a primary physician. But mm -hmm. that a physician can now by law, like in Florida, don't say gay. So it's moving out of schools now into into uh, what do you call it med medicine. Mm -hmm. And so that's and, probably and, something and, that's going to be and continuing. Hairstyle, and hairstyles for women, as the burqa in France. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Let me see if there's, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to share those in the chat or the Q&A and we'll forward those to Ed. Um, let's see, here's another question from earlier. Do you suppose that the large white nationalist presence in the US military is in some way related to our choice to abolish the, the draft and depend on an all volunteer military? If so, is this exaggerated by the effective restriction of choices, opportunities, our socioeconomic realities maintained? 
Well, I, there's, there are about four or five books that can be, read, can be written here, and one of them, and I want to quote the late Dr. Fra, Dr. King, late in the sense of his late writings, when, when, he, when people told him to shut up about Vietnam, he said, I can't shut up about Vietnam because uh, Vietnam is a war that's being fought, quote, I think his phrase is by black and brown boys. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, and then you go back to the New York, New York laws and then the Civil War, where if you had three hundred dollars, you could actually get somebody else to take your place in the draft. Mm -hmm. um, the, the U.S. military has always been a class system, and there is there is a lot to be said to the fact that uh, a volunteer Navy, a volunteer Army, and a volunteer military. I don't know how else you would do this. I honestly don't know, but. But, but there is something to what is being said there. But that the other extreme is that the, when one had a draft, the persons who, I mean, I, I had a 4-0 deferment because I was in school. Um, many of my colleagues who did, did not have that, who, who went, either went to Canada or to, to Vietnam and had happened to them what they happened, they did not have the access that I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Well, Edward, thanks again so much for anyone that joined us late. I will email out the two links for the recordings, both for this program and the one we did last week. So thank you so much for participating with us. And Edward, most thanks goes to you for sharing your knowledge on this difficult but important topic for us to learn more about with that. Any final closing thoughts? I want to, can you see the, the uh, screen, Robert? Oh yeah, I sure can. Yep. Okay. Uh, for, for those who have followed me in it, in a slightly different topic, we're still talking about dominance in power, and it's a different focus, perhaps. And I mean, and, and it's, we're going to look at expanding the moral circle, thinking about uh, sentience and, and animals, culture, and justice. And this is the third of a series around the environment and animals that, that I will, will have done. Robert has two of them. Thanks again to Robert, DC Culture and History. Uh, this is tomorrow night, Sunday night at uh, five o'clock. Correct, Robert? Five o'clock. And we're going to use the exact same Zoom connection information. So keep it simple. Oh, really? Great. Uh, yeah, and we'll again, uh, my, my endless respect for people, persons who take the time out to learn a little bit about what will then be your topic to go off and find out for yourself. I thank you and respect the work that you do. And uh, in this time, a uh, hard time internationally and a hard time biologically, uh, medically, uh, take care and be safe. Thank you. Edward, thanks, thanks again for sharing your knowledge with us and giving us some things to think about. Good night. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend.